Welcome back to Stories of Windsor, a podcast celebrating the rich history of our community by the river. On this episode, we'll take a musical journey into Windsor's past and discuss the historical significance of folk music within the different regions along the Detroit River. Welcome back to Stories of Windsor, a podcast about stories from this Detroit River region. I am Carla Morano. I'm an LSR here at Windsor Public Library. I'm joined with my co-host today. Mary Lou Gillison. I'm a librarian for the Local History and Genealogy uh, Department for Windsor Public Library. And today we are very pleased to have a special guest. Would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's Sean Antea. Um, I work at the John Muir branch of the Windsor Public Library, and I run a lot of music programs there, uh, concerts and different talks about music history. Today, uh, we'll be talking with Sean, who's prepared a lot of wonderful research on traditional music of the Detroit River region. Before we get started with that, I would like to do a land acknowledgement We record this podcast on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. We respect and honor First Nations' longstanding relationship to the land along the Detroit River in what's now called Windsor-Essex County. Thank you so much for being our guest today, Sean. Could you give us a brief rundown of what you'll be talking about today and how you were inspired to research this topic? Yeah, so thanks for having me here, guys. I'll mainly be talking about the traditional music of our region uh, based on a talk that I did at the John Muir branch back in October. Um, I actually got the idea to do this uh, when I was working a shift at our local history branch, and I came across some recordings of traditional songs of the Detroit River region uh, done by a professor of musicology at the University of Sudbury named Marcel Benito. I got really excited because I was looking for something along these lines for a long time. I've always been interested in, you know, traditional folk music, uh, whether it's blues or country music, bluegrass, things like that. But while, you know, I know so much about the history of blues songs from the Mississippi Delta, uh, I knew comparatively little about the traditional music of our own region uh, or the music that my French Canadian ancestors would have played and listened to. No doubt over drinks of whiskey, wine, and a <laughs> thick cloud of tobacco smoke. Um, you know, my grandfather used to tell me stories of the big parties that the family used to have on their farms on the banks of the Thames River uh, out in Prairie Siding, kind of near Chatham there. Um, you know, there'd be harmonicas and fiddles and lots of drink, uh, and the parties would go on for days. Uh, as he put it, you ate when you were hungry and you slept when you were tired. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, at the time I kind of sat down and I did a bit of research on the traditional music of our region. Can you tell us anything about the musical traditions of the indigenous peoples who lived along the Detroit River? Yeah, so of course, the first peoples of our region, as you mentioned earlier, you know, um, it includes the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi. Uh, the Odawa, uh, along with the Huron and the Wendat, uh, among many others who traveled through our region as well. So the music of our region for the first many thousands of years were the songs of these peoples and their forebearers. Many songs were either sung or chanted with sparse instrumentation, uh, often with animal hide drums or other rhythmic instruments such as rattles made out of gourds. Mm. Um, Wow. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Some of the groups also used flutes and whistles, uh, particularly amongst the Ojibwe. Of course, when Europeans arrived, they began to mix uh, their cultural traditions and instrumentation uh, with those of these new settlers as well. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Sean. In addition to Indigenous peoples, we know that French Canadians settled along the Detroit River on both sides. Have you found any interesting examples of French Canadian folk music from this region? Yeah, so in our area, of course, as you mentioned, you know, the big settler influence was uh, French Canadian and their folk music in particular. So this traditionally involved a lot of fiddle playing and rhythmic accompaniment by things like spoons, uh, bones, foot tapping, uh, and jaw harps. In addition to the influence from France, it's also the product of kind of mingling with uh, Celtic music uh, due to the close proximity also of uh, Irish settlers as well. Of course, they're also mixing in there with uh, the traditional indigenous music and folklore in the region. And there's actually a really good movie that you can check out online called Medicine Fiddle. It's from the 1990s. It traces these connections uh, between French and Irish and Scots um, and the various indigenous groups and, of course, the Métis who who kind of come out of that. And it's essentially, you know, the music that the social and economic relationships uh, of the fur trade that that those relationships ended up producing. 
So the first recording we're actually going to play is by an Ojibwe fiddler named Joe Cloud, and this is from a 1930s field recording, actually from Wisconsin, uh, by Alan Lomax, who I'm going to talk a little bit more a little later. And this is sort of a good example of the syncretic fiddle music of the Great Lakes region, uh, popular amongst French Canadians and other Indigenous groups in our area, which also bears a strong Celtic influence. He recorded this one in Wisconsin, but he also found a lot of examples of this song uh, around Michigan as well. And you can imagine this song also being played on our side of the border. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty cool product of these uh, relationships of the fur trade. common theme that you've noticed in our own regional folk music. Yeah, so like a lot of folk music, a lot of the songs of our region are work-related songs. You know, there's uh, rowing songs for fur traders in the canoe, there's songs for lumberjacks to sing while cutting timber, camp songs, you know, singing by the fire after a day's work. Others, of course, are ballads which tell stories, you know, whether they're happy, sad, or humorous. And, you know, others are just simply fun or silly, uh, and they're meant for parties and festivities at the tavern and those sorts of things. But what's really interesting is that many of the songs in our region here in Windsor and Essex County in particular uh, actually have their origins in medieval France. Um, and so while some of these songs have mutated in all sorts of ways, others remained relatively unchanged from their old world origins. Um, and part of this is, is due to the way that our local local French population was relatively isolated from the rest of the French world as a result partially of the British conquest, but also the remoteness of the frontier. So these songs and stories could sometimes be preserved uh, very closely to their original form. And this is actually similar, uh, if I can make kind of an analogy here, similar in some ways to the old so-called Jesuit pear trees in our region, which produce a very unique breed of pears that you can no longer find elsewhere in the world. And so these are trees that have been bred out of existence in France, but continue to live on here in Windsor and Essex County. You can see these trees down uh, over at the Duff Bobby House. Uh, they have a few there, and you can actually also see the most famous Jesuit pear tree, which is actually a, an original centuries-old tree. Uh, it's out in Harrow. Because of these kind of comparisons between the pears and the music, Marcel Beneteau, uh, the guy who I was talking about earlier, he uses this imagery of the pear tree in his album art uh, for this reason. So it's pretty cool. That is fascinating uh, to hear about the Jesuit pear trees and their significance, as well as the common theme of work in early French Canadian folk music. I think that's something we can all still kind of relate to and how the use of ballads in folk music is so universal, like it's common in blues and even country music as well, to be storytellers essentially through music. We know that French Canadians settled all over Canada and not just here along the Detroit River. So was there anything particular or unique to the French Canadians who did settle in this region? Yeah, so much like the pear trees, our French Canadian culture here in the Detroit River region is very unique. It has its own music, its own patois, its own kind of syncretic culture, which is sometimes referred to as muskrat French, uh, which is kind of a fun name. Is that Piri versus Pierre? Yeah, well, it might have something to do with that. I'm not sure. Yeah. and things like that. Our, yeah. our fun street names here in Olette, Windsor. Wallet. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so this name, the muskrat French, comes from the French-Canadian Catholic tradition of eating muskrat, especially on Fridays, because as we all know, muskrat is a type of fish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> and so this is a tradition which actually dates back uh, at least a few hundred years uh, when there was supposedly a bishop who granted Catholics in our area a what's called a dispensation to allow them to eat muskrat on Fridays. Um, and this has actually caused uh, some pretty significant controversies with, within the church in Detroit and around Windsor and stuff. So, you know, it's it's pretty interesting, maybe even a subject for a future podcast. <laughs> or the lyrics of muskrat love. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Obviously, we're all a bunch of history buffs here who love not only hearing the stories, but we want to know what inspires the historian. We want to know where you found your material. So when you did this research on folk music from this region, where did you look? And are there any particular scholars that stand out as pioneers in this field? Yeah, so a lot of what we have documented about the folk songs in our region, uh, whether it's French-Canadian or otherwise, it's a result of the work of musicologists and folklorists, uh, both professional and amateur. Um, and they, you know, these are people who went around finding elders to share songs and stories, learn and document these traditions. And uh, as always, you know, I like to give a promo for our local history branch uh, where you can find the writings and records and recordings of a lot of this stuff. We, we so. love a promo. We yeah. love it. I, I'm very happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, person who I really want to highlight here is uh, Marcel Beneteau, mm -hmm. who's actually from Windsor originally. Um, and then later he was an ethnology professor at the University of Sudbury. And he's done some really incredible work on the history of uh, French culture and music in this region, compiling, you know, just tons of songs um, and doing his own recordings as kind of a way to preserve these really traditional songs. And, you know, he's one of these guys who went around Essex County finding elders, finding old notebooks, homemade songbook, and, and recording and documenting a lot of these traditional French-Canadian songs, uh, some of which are actually quite rare, especially in North America. And I believe I believe the total number of songs that he tracked down, whether in one form or another, is over a thousand. Wow. That's um, incredible. So yeah, he, he's done a ton of work uh, in this regard. And, and then later what he did is he put out three albums containing these songs of our region. And so I really can't stress, you know, how valuable uh, the work is that he's done, you know, pre just preserving this French Canadian culture. Uh, and I'd also like to thank him for allowing us to use some of his recordings for our podcast today. I'm so impressed with Marcel's ability to track down not only track down these recordings or these traditional songs but you have to establish relationships when you're dealing with elders and like because you need to gain trust in order Absolutely. for them to share this important information with you so i really applaud him for that effort it's incredible are you able to share any examples of the music that marcel beneteau was able to preserve yeah, so, so we're going to play a couple songs here. And the first one that we're going to play is really a good example of one of these medieval French folk songs that have been preserved in our region over the centuries. And it's titled Le Cheval en Peinture, meaning in English, uh, the painted horse. Mm. Uh, and it, its lyrics are really quite funny. So essentially, the song tells the story of two young lovers who go out to the woods to be alone. When things start escalating, uh, the girl tells her lover that if they don't go any further than, you know, kissing, she will reward him with her father's horse, which is the finest in the land. So her lover agrees to this deal and they go back home where she presents him with a painting of a horse. Mm -hmm. And she then tells him that he missed his chance with her. So <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. So we'll play this one. Uh, and, and, you know, as you were mentioning, Carla, you know, it's really important also to you know, recognize uh, some of these older folks in the community who pass these things on to Marcel. So he got this version, actually, um, from a woman named uh, Rita Dupuis in La Salle. Uh, and also Stella Malosh, who actually helped Marcel track down over 150 of these traditional French songs of the Detroit River region. So obviously, you know, a, a big thanks to them as well for the work they did in preserving this stuff, too. Amazing. So we'll play Le Cheval en Peinture now. <laughs> Thank you. 
À chaque point que elle faisait, son cher amant ne salua et par un doux baiser elle le récompensa. La belle veux-tu venir, la belle veux-tu venir au bois sur la fugère? Ah oui, amant, franc cavalier, avec toi je m'en irai et avec mon honneur je m'en reviendrai. Mais quand elle fut rendue, mais quand elle fut rendue au bois sur la fugère, puis mit la main sur son genou, par deux trois fois lui fit la doux la belle embrasse, et moi je n'aimerai que vous. Galant veux-tu venir, galant veux-tu venir au loge sur mon père, mon père y en a des beaux chevaux. Le roi en a pas des plus beaux, laissez-moi y aller, vous aurez le plus beau. Un cheval en peinture Ah oh, tiens mon amant, voici le cheval Que je t'avais promis au bois Vite en bas, dessus et promptement t'en va Faut-il pour un cheval, faut-il pour un cheval Qui n'a ni sel ni bride Avoir ah, laissé aller, avoir ah, laissé aller Une si belle jolie fille Oh, qu'un tu ressembles à un esparvier Qui qu'un la caille de sous ses pieds Plutôt de la tenir et la laissant en aller was really cool. Do you have any others you'd like to share with us? Yeah, so this one uh, is a little bit different. This is more of a tr uh, typical kind of traditional party song called Un Petit Verre de Beer, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess you can probably imagine what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> Song's lyrics here essentially say that a bit of beer would do the trick but whiskey makes my head spin. And this is a traditional yeah. found. Yeah, 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 I can't, I mean, I can't imagine why. Yeah. Sometimes language is universal. Yeah, that's right. yeah. I prefer the whiskey myself. <laughs> and so, you know, this is a traditional song found all around Windsor, Essex. The version here that Marcel recorded, he originally obtained this version in McGregor from Bella Ladisseur who in turn uh, learned it from her father, Cléophas Levac. So here it is, un petit verre de beer. Un petit verre de bière fera mon affaire, mais du whisky, ça m'étourdit. Un petit verre de bière fera mon affaire, mais du whisky, ça m'étourdit. Nous voilà tous arrivés dans ce petit village à boire et à chanter, à mener le carnage. Un petit verre de bière fera mon affaire, mais du whisky, ça m'étourdit. Un petit verre de bière fera Un petit coup, 
Thank you so much for sharing the important work of Marcel Beneteau with us. The number of songs he was able to document and preserve is astonishing. Are there any other scholars or researchers uh, who have made an impact on the music preservation of this region? Yeah, so to kind of uh, move beyond kind of just the French Canadian music, the other trove of music history from our broader region, especially going into Michigan, is from Alan Lomax, who's uh, an American ethnomusicologist. So many people are familiar with Lomax and his father John's work in the American South, recording blues singers and folk singers. Most notably, John Lomax got the great folk singer Lead Belly released from a federal prison wow. uh, where he had been convicted on murder charges. <laughs> and so the Lomax has <laughs> really kind of hit their stride, you know, in the 1930s during the Great Depression when President Roosevelt set up the Works Progress Administration to try and kind of put people to work. Some of this was related to building infrastructure, building highways, uh, building many of the national parks in the United States, post offices, all sorts of things like that. But another component to this was cultural, you know, hiring painters to decorate government buildings with beautiful murals, getting people like Orson Welles, getting started with theater and things like that. And then another cultural component was related to music music and kind of just documenting the rich and diverse history of American folk music. And I really like this quote from Alan Lomax, uh, which he had this to say about the purpose of his work. So he says, quote, Now we of the jets, of the wireless, and the atom blast are on the verge of sweeping completely off the globe what unspoiled folklore is left, at least wherever it cannot quickly conform to the success-motivated standards of our urban-conditioned consumer economy. What was once an ancient tropical garden of immense color and variety is in danger of being replaced by a comfortable but sterile and sleep-inducing system of cultural superhighways with just one type of diet and one available kind of music. Wow. So yeah, a pretty broad, you know, kind of uh, statement there, but I think there's something to it. it. This was the kind of feeling that inspired him to kind of go out there and document this traditional music before it was lost forever. And I still think it's an important objective for similar reasons to Lomax. I and mean, this is partially why I do, you know, these kind of folk concerts and things over at John Muir Branch to kind of promote and preserve these older and more obscure forms of music that people might not encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. So how were the Lomaxes able to preserve the music from the area? Uh, can you tell us anything about their methodology? How did they collect this information? Basically what the Lomaxes did is they set out across uh, the United States initially anyway. They had portable rec recording equipment. This is in the 1930s, but even then they had kind of this primitive recording equipment. They had film cameras, they had notepads. They're going all over searching for all sorts of traditional music for the Library of Congress. And so while the recordings in the American South are probably the most famous, when I was doing my research for this presentation, I came across some kind of fascinating information uh, from Alan Lomax's 1938 Michigan expedition. So we actually went over to Michigan and so the liner notes to a recent compilation from his Michigan recordings uh, have this to say. In 1938, the Library of Congress dispatched Alan Lomax, already a seasoned field worker at age 23, to complete a folk life survey of the Great Lakes region. He set off in a 1935 Plymouth Deluxe four-door sedan, toting a presto instantaneous disc recorder, a still camera, and a moving image camera. He returned almost three months later, having driven thousands of miles on barely paved roads with a cache of 250 discs and eight reels of film. These materials documented the diversity of ethnicity, including Irish, Finnish, Serbian, Polish, German, Croatian, Canadian, French, Hungarian, and more in Michigan, 
as well as a uh, cultural expression among loggers and lake sailors. So pretty diverse kind of group of people that he's recording. And he would later say that the Michigan area was the most richly varied area for folk music that I had ever visited, combining as it did the lusty tradition of the northern wood singer with an infinitely varied pattern of immigrant European, Indian, and even Appalachian and Southern black music. Mm. And he would say also too that the region was the most fertile source of American folklore. And so he's driving around Michigan, but a lot of you know the cultural traditions that he was documenting also would have been found uh, in places in Ontario too. So I think that's pretty important to kind of recognize as well. Wow, I, I love that idea that a, di a diverse array of cultures and ethnicities influenced the musical expressions of the Detroit River region, despite any perceived cultural differences uh, among the groups that settled here, I imagine that they shared some common experiences and perceptions of the area and what it meant to live here. Can you tell us anything about that? Or can you speak to the way that folk singers used their music to comment on issues affecting the people of this region? Actually, one of the most well-known uh, and interesting songs that he recorded on this trip is called Michigan I.O. And Michigan I.O. is kind of more of a labor song. Um, you know, earlier I was talking about work songs and things like that. And it's actually similar to another song called Canada I.O., Although this is not to be confused with a song called Canada I.O., oh. which is a completely different song. Which is I think you mean I.O. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even Sorry. intend on saying that. <laughs> Sorry, I was bad just joke. Saying, I was like, wow. Bad yeah. joke. <laughs> and th that's actually a completely different song about a woman sneaking onto a boat to join her lover. Uh, but... Michigan I.O. and Canada I.O. <laughs> uh, are also similar to a Western theme song called the Buffalo Skinners. And just to make a side note here, there were actually bison in Windsor, Essex County. Well, it wasn't called that at the time. But uh, in our region, anyway, during uh, the 17th century, if you read uh, Patrick Broad's great book, River and Land, mm -hmm. there's a quote right at the start from, a, a, I believe he was a Jesuit priest uh, named Father Hennepin, and he observes, you know, all the, uh, all the bison in the region. So I just thought that was a fun kind of aside about, uh, you know, people don't associate Windsor with bison, but it was <laughs> definitely <once> not. No. <laughs> wow, it was once reality. So anyway, so this song, Michigan I.O., it's a labor song. It's similar to these other labor songs, which are found in Canada and other places in the U.S. Similar melodies and similar themes. And it's important to remember, you know, the fluidity of the border at this time, and the fact that a lot of the stuff that Lomax recorded in Michigan would have been sung in Ontario. The man that Lomax recorded in the 1930s, Lester Wells, said that he had learned this song around 1880 from a man from Saginaw. Both Michigan I.O. and Canada I.O. have the same kind of themes and lyrics uh, just with locations swapped, uh, essentially deriding the exploitative uh, practices of the lumber industry, cruel bosses, and inhumane living conditions in the lumber camps. And so while it was kind of common that so songs would poke fun at bad bosses or poor working conditions, it was uncommon that songs would be quite this radical in their critique, unless it was, you know, the folk singers of explicitly political singers like, say, Joe Hill uh, and Harry McClintock of uh, the Industrial Workers of the World, or, say, maybe later protest singers like Woody Guthrie. So the song is kind of radical and unique in that sense, and that's also something that Lomax would have been pretty interested in, since he was kind of well known for sort of left-wing political sensibilities, mm -hmm. uh, and he was co constantly hounded by the FBI for this reason. The other thing thing that stands out to me with this song is that you get a sense of how for a long time uh, most of Canada and many of the upper Midwest states like Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, you know, these were really sort of these dangerous hinterlands on the frontier. Uh, and it really stayed that way in the popular imagination for some time. You know, there's settlers had panics about indigenous people, especially after Pontiac's Rebellion, which kind of freaked the settlers out anyway. And then, you know, there's black bears, there's man-eating wolves, <laughs> there's uh, wolverines. Michigan is the wolverine state, after all, uh, although now they're only in Ann Arbor. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> and they wear blue and gold. Yeah, that's weird. A, well, maize and blue. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <But> sorry. <laughs> there's all these kind of critters, there's dense forests. Uh, hopefully the wolverines, you know, the, the furry wolverines will come back someday. But, uh, mm. you know, so there's all these things in the popular imagination. And it's tied into uh, the stories of, you know, folk heroes like Paul Bunyan, you know, who are kind of 
these crazy Frenchmen who could actually survive or even thrive in these rugged conditions. So you have people like in uh, 1764, you've got British General Thomas Gage referring to the French of Detroit as, quote, a people as wild as the country they go in, or the people they deal with, referring there to the indigenous people. And he says, the French are far more vicious and wicked. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is kind of, you know, the British sensibilities anyway of, of, of what they think about the people that live mm -hmm. here in our region. So anyway, th these are all the sorts of things that feed into the creation of a song like Michigan I.O., so we're going to play here this song, Michigan I.O. Uh, this is, again, a recording of Lester Wells, recorded by Alan Lomack in 1938. We'll listen to it right now. Early in the season, the fall of 63, the preacher of the gospel one day come to me. He says, my clever fellow, how would you like to go? For to spend a winter a lumbering in Michigan, I owe. Oh, so boldly I stepped up to him, these words to him did say. On going out there a lumbering depends upon the pay. If you will pay good wages, my passage to and fro, I'll go spend a winter a lumbering in Michigan. Again, I owe. Oh, which I will pay good wages, I'll pay your passage out, providing you sign papers that you will stay the route. Oh, but if you do get homesick and swear it home you go, I'll not pay your passage over to me. Again, I owe. Oh, and by that kind of flattery, we enlisted quite a train. Oh, some twenty-five or thirty young, able-bodied men. Oh, we had a pleasant voyage on the road we had to go. Oh, they landed us in Saginaw, called Michigan, I owe. Oh, it's now a joy that ended and the troubles they've begun. Oh, Smith and Williams, they done till they come rolling in. Oh, they sent us in a country, the road we did not know. Orders up on the rifle river in Michigan, I owe. For to tell the way we suffered, it is beyond the heart of man. But to give the fair description, I'll do the best I can. Our grub, the dogs, they'd laugh at our beds built on the snow. Oh, God grant there is no bigger hell than Michigan, I owe. Our grub, the dogs, they'd laugh at our beds built on the snow. Oh, God grant there is no bigger hell than Michigan, I owe. Oh, it's now the winter is finished and it's homeward we are bound. It's in this cursed country no longer we'll be found. We'll go home to our wives and sweethearts, tell others not to go. To that God-forsaken country, oh, call me again, I owe. We'll go home to our wives and sweethearts, tell others not to go. To that God-forsaken country, oh, call me again, I owe. Sean, I just want to thank you so much for guiding us through the folk music tradition of the Detroit River area. It was absolutely fascinating. Are there any last remarks you'd like to make about the topic? Of course, I really encourage a lot of people out there to um, explore some more on, you know, this kind of music history, the work of, say, you know, the Lomaxes. We have a couple books here uh, at the Windsor Public Library that were written by John and Alan Lomax. And there's a trove of information you can find online at the Library of Congress website. Uh, and also Alan Lomax's uh, organization called the Association for Cultural Equity. Um, and even a lot of Lomax's uh, videos and field recordings are uploaded on YouTube. And then, of course, I would encourage you to listen to Marcel Beneteau's music as well. Um, we've got some of his CDs at the Local History Branch and the John Muir Branch. 
Um, so you can listen to it there. And he's got some articles as well online mm -hmm. that you can find about um, the history of, you know, uh, the French Canadian culture in our region. And just again, you know, I want to give a thank you to Marcel for allowing us to use his songs. And also uh, Melanie Zeck, who is a librarian at the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress, kind of helped us navigate some copyright issues and things with those uh, Alan Lomax recordings. So uh, thanks again for helping us make a great podcast here today. That's fantastic. Again, thank you, Sean, for being our special guest today. Maybe we'll have uh, have you back to talk about muskrats at some point. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't play that awful song. Okay. <laughs> Can so I recommend a couple of books? Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. Um, one website I would recommend is the Canadian National Music Site. It's uh, done by the Canadian Encyclopedia, and there is a lot of material on war music, folk music, um, Canadian music, obviously, and I highly recommend that, as well as a book by Owen B. Jones, uh, Musicians of Windsor, and as well as Ruth Ann uh, Shad's book, uh, Breaking Loose. Another interesting resource that speaks specifically to our local, current, and past musical scene is windsormusictangle.com, mm -hmm. and I think that was put together by the owner of Fog Lounge. Oh, and Tom Lucher? Yeah, and it kind of chronicles different musicians and where they've played locally in the Windsor, Essex County. It's kind of a neat website. It's mm -hmm. like this giant map. And, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I remember when they had that on the wall uh, where people were drawing. Yes. The thing. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. also a Facebook page called uh, Windsor Music by Scotty Hughes, and he keeps it strictly to what gig you went to, what, who did you play with, do you remember this show? It's not about promoting your next show. It's There's no commercials. It's strictly about talking about Windsor and music. And also, recently, Internet Archive also has a really great digitized collection of punk rock posters from Detroit and Windsor from 1978 to 1985. And there's about 200 old posters of just bands who played especially in the Detroit punk rock scene, which is incredible, especially that time period. That is really cool. Yeah. Archive.org also has basically every Grateful Dead show oh, ever yes, recorded. Oh, yes, that's their <laughs> And they donated Including in them. Detroit. Yeah. And they donated yeah. them. Are yes. you a deadhead? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, yes, they do have a lot of, of music that is uh, available to the public. I love it. I go on there all the time. Yeah, they do. Yeah. So... <laughs> Well, that was a really fascinating discussion we had today, um, talking about long ago traditions of Indigenous and French Canadian settlement and the Michigan influence. Absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you, Sean. And we'll catch you next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. On our next episode, we'll do some island hopping along the Detroit River and explore Belle Isle, Pesh Island, and not to be forgotten, the infamous hum of Zug Island. Thank you for listening. This has been a Windsor Public Library digital branch production.